Good morning. My name is Inga Cotton. I'm the founder and executive director of San Antonio Charter Moms. And um, these are Charter Moms chats that we do at 9 a.m. on weekdays. And it's a way to um, keep sharing um, resources. You know, so for a while we were talking a lot about distance learning and kids learning from home. And uh, now we're talking about summer activities and ways to keep your kids learning. And uh, today we have a special guest. We have Troy Peters, who's the music director of Youth Orchestras of San Antonio, also known as YOSA. Um, he's also orchestra conductor at uh, UTSA here in San Antonio. Um, he has two kids, Ronnie and Max. He says they grew up listening to classical music, but they are kind of into show tunes nowadays. <laughs> that's how it goes, right? Um, and so Troy has written a guest post for us um, that's going to go live soon on our, our page about uh, lots of different summer activities because we want to give families inspiration um, about how to, you know how to try a new thing. Um, each day this summer. And uh, he wrote on the topic of classical music, which is something very dear to me. Um, if you all follow me on uh, Instagram, you've seen me like take my kids to the symphony and um, you know we play classical music at home. Um, so, but I have a bunch of questions for Troy to uh, get his advice about introducing kids to classical music. Um, so in his post, he talked about um, how to get young kids engaged with classical music. And he said that one thing is they love to dance to music and um, he said, suggested having classical music play, kind of playing in the background while you're sitting on the floor um, playing with your kids. So uh, Trey, I was wondering if you could talk more about how classical music is connected to dance and what do you, what do you think it is that um, gets kids moving, um, you know, when they're they're having playtime, like the, the young kids, how they respond to classical music. Absolutely. Well, first of all, good morning, Inga. Thank you for having me. It's great to have a chance to talk to you and talk to everybody at San Antonio Charter Moms. Um, you know, I think all music is connected to dance. That's the real thing to remember that that music for thousands of years has been about singing, celebrating, dancing, worshiping, uh, expressing our most primal and most powerful emotions. And so it makes sense that with any music, moving is one of the most powerful ways to get any of us to connect. And when you think back to music you loved in childhood, no matter what kind of music it was, you probably have memories of dancing around the kitchen with your parents or playing on the floor while you listen to a favorite piece of music. And I really sincerely believe that the concept of classical music being special music isn't a very useful concept. I think music is music and there's lots and lots of different kinds of sounds there's lots and lots of different styles and genres of music but the only thing that makes classical music classical is that when we used to have record stores we needed some place to put it um you know other than that it's it's just it's a sound it's a it's a style um so I, I always try to, in, in whether I'm introducing music to kids or whether I'm talking to just anybody, adults, I think it's really important to not feel like, oh, this isn't for me. You know, um, the, the power of, and, and kids are a great way for parents to learn this. If you put on Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which, you know, is this piece, it's a piece from, um, the 19 teens um, from you know 19, 1912, I believe, um, that um, when it when it premiered in Paris caused a riot in the theater. People were punching each other in the face and screaming at each other because it was musically revolutionary. Um, some of that might have been staged as a publicity stunt, but there was definitely conflict. There was definitely like disagreement, right? This music that was so crazy and out there. Well, today, if you put if you put the Rite of Spring on in the background with toddlers, they are going to rock out because the music is <laughs> rhythmic and exciting and engaging, and it's every bit as primal and intense as Metallica or as the clash or you know as the kinks if you're somebody who loves um the 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 the, the my, i guess my point is i think because music's linked to culture for adults um we in adolescence kind of 
identify our persona by choosing a musical style that's who we are, right? I'm into this subgenre of Detroit techno, um, or I'm into this mopey band where I stare at my shoes and cry. And, you know, I did that too, and I still love the Smiths, and I still love Prince, and I still love Elvis Costello, because I'm from the 80s. But, um, you know, there's, there's so much connection that's possible. And our kids can teach us, they don't have those preconceptions about like which style is cool. So to get back to your question, the, the movement that all music or most music invites is a great way to get kids to connect with and love and remember music. So with my own kids when they were young, um, one of the things that I did was absolutely play the Rite of Spring, play Aaron Copland's music, play Duke Ellington's music, play the Beatles, play um, just a really wide variety of stuff and try to foster and encourage like movement and just way rocking back and forth and, and, you know, jumping up and down and kind of head banging. And, you know, there's just a lot of music that, that kids are going to do that on their own too. As long as you give them a forum, you know, give them permission and a vibe. And if you're, if you're moving when you feel like it, your kids are going to move too. And if your kids move and you respond to it and turn it into a game, they're going to, they're going to, laugh and enjoy that um and there are for my kids there are still pieces of music and by pieces of music i mean i might mean a beethoven symphony or i might mean you know a a, a song by kanye west they're just pieces of music that right. that they remember from their childhood and when they come on they go like yeah my my <laughs> son max um the the song uh we Are Young by Fun was big when he was in preschool. And there was one time, maybe four years old, where he started singing along in his car seat and like rocking back and forth. And we managed to get it on video. And that then became like a piece of his identity. Like that's his <laughs> song. But they, my kids also have that with some pieces of classical music. And for me, I think that's the most important thing with kids is to just have them fall in love with sounds. And the last thing I'd say on that is I think all of us, you know, have pieces of culture that we want our kids to love too, because they matter to us, right? We, we have movies that we love and we want our kids to love them too. And when your kid loves Ferris Bueller's Day Off as much as you do, um, <laughs> or your kid loves bed knobs and broomsticks or whatever it is, as much as you do, there's a bond there, right? Um, but it there's a great opportunity for us as parents to grow beyond our own favorites too, and to, to help our kids find pathways into stuff that we didn't have a chance to listen to. And I promise you that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or Stravinsky's Rite of Spring or William Grant Still's Afro-American Symphony are gonna be things that your kids will rock out to and will fall in love with. Nobody doesn't like that music as long as they're welcomed to it as long as it isn't introduced as something that's complicated and hard to figure out because it's not it's just it's just music right so it's all music don't get hung up on the genre and uh i think i think a challenge for parents is um sometimes they hesitate they're like oh i don't want to take my kid to a classical music thing because they won't know how to act in that situation and and what you're suggesting is that if you if you do it at home and you don't present it you don't build it up you just present it as like let's listen to some great music and you mix it up with you know some some pop, some jazz, um, some rock, and some classical. Mix it all together, um, and 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 then encourage acting out and music and moving to it. Then it's not intimidating. It's not like oh you know well you're not smart enough to listen to this music or you can't sit still long enough to listen to this music, right? It's not there's no there's no barrier there. It's it's right. just listen to it, soak it up, move, have fun, you know, like look at all this range of human experience. And you can pick pieces of this to be part of your identity. And you can also be, be be a listener, be someone who is open to lots of different kinds of music. Right. And the other thing to to, to mention, since you mentioned, you know, the, the the concert hall experience or going to hear concerts, is there's no question there are aspects of of live music 
in the classical music world that aren't welcoming of some of the things that are great for kids to do when they listen to music, right? If if it's Saturday night at 9 p.m. and you're sitting in the Tobin Center and the San Antonio Symphony is about to start playing a Brahms symphony, like that's not an environment where a toddler is going to have a successful listening experience. And frankly, it's the presence of almost any toddler just because of who they are is going to be something that isn't going to be compatible with that experience for the rest of the audience. But that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities to bring kids because there are concerts that are designed for children and families where a little bit more noise and a a lot more movement is welcome. And um, so I think that's something to be okay with. And then in San Antonio, we don't have as much live um, classical music outdoors, unfortunately, because of our climate. Um, But if you're ever traveling, in the summertime and you have a chance to go to a summer concert in the Northeast or in Chicago or in Seattle, or, you know, there are these places where these incredibly gorgeous, beautiful outdoor venues like Tanglewood in Massachusetts um, or Ravenia in Chicago, where like, there's nothing more amazing than just like sitting on that lawn, having a picnic and, you know, rolling around and high-fiving each other and just like enjoying this vibe. In San Antonio summers, it's harder to do that. But anyway, I would just say like, um, yes, the classical music concert experience and listening to jazz live too, going to Jazz Texas, um, which is an amazing venue. Like some things about those experiences aren't welcoming for young children, right? That's more the kind of thing you do with a teenager where like a kid who's 13, 14, 15, and has fallen in love with this music they grew up with, gets to go hear a Beethoven symphony live for the first time. And that can be so much fun. Um, and so it's it's like a lot of things, It's there are developmental points where certain aspects of the experience make more sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, some of these things, it's harder to access. Like there's not as much live music performance happening right now because right. it's not safe for people to gather, but it will come back, right? So like, like in the past, uh, we've heard members of the San Antonio Symphony play at the public library. Uh, or we've, we've heard like teaching artists from Opera San Antonio uh, sing at the libraries. And right. uh, those are those are welcoming. Those are like kid friendly places. Absolutely. And, I guess, and they're, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, most musicians are really committed to that. In fact, one of the things that's driving all of us crazy right now in the midst of the pandemic is we can't do the thing we do without other people, you know, both other musicians mm-hmm. to work with but also connecting with an audience and all the streaming of solo concerts in the world is not going to bring that back yet. The good news is it's going to come back. It's a question of when, not if. Yeah. Yeah, it will. And then um, one thing that you mentioned in the post, I'll I'll add it to the description is uh, uh, yosa.org slash plays on is where um, that you all have been doing things like interviews. And I guess there's some performance material there and some things that you're working on. So that's sort of the the where families can access like the virtual offerings um, from Yosa, which but like you said, it's not the same as as actually, you know, performing in, in an ensemble or performing to an audience and having that that human connection. Um, I think okay, g- going back to uh, what you said about um, uh, we were talking about um, like settings that um, are good for kids to be exposed to classical music. Um, and uh, in the piece you mentioned. Um, Peter and the Wolf, which is a like so let's see, that's by Prokofiev, right? And it's um, what's fun about that is that you know the, the different animals get personified by different instruments, uh, but it's a great way to in- introduce the orchestra um, to kids. So I was wondering if you could talk more about that piece, and or if there are other examples of of those kind of you know everyone in the orchestra gets their turn <laughs> kind of pieces. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. Are, like, good, good things for families to play for their kids at home. Right. And I mean, a lot of us remember from our childhood, whether it's in general music class at school or going to a family concert somewhere or just being at home and hearing Peter and the Wolf is the one that people remember the most. Um, There's another story called Tubby the Tuba that some people heard in their childhood. That's more kind of a previous generation. It doesn't show up as much. But if you go out and look for Tubby the Tuba, it's a goofy, funny, enjoyable little story that um, is mainly just a children's story with with adorable music, but along the way there are some elements of connecting the characters to the sounds you're hearing. In Peter and the Wolf, it's a little bit more explicit. Of you know, the, you're going to learn to recognize what an oboe sounds like because you're going to care about the duck 
and the character of the duck is going to go through this journey and have these adventures and the oboe is going to be the personification of that and so by the end of the story like most kids for the rest of their life when they hear an oboe think of the duck and peter and the wolf and at least at least as a piece of that picture and it you know it's not like being able to identify an oboe is the most important life skill but it is kind of fun to be one of those people who can who can know that's a clarinet, that's an oboe, that's a flute, that's a saxophone, that's a bassoon. They sound different from each other, and I know which one's which. Um, and uh, so the story helps with that. It also helps Peter and the Wolf also helps younger listeners kind of develop the idea of musical narrative. That listening to a piece of music is like following a plot. And when you hear a theme, a particular melody connected to a character, and then later you hear that same melody, but it's sadder sounding. And then later you hear that same melody, but it's jaunty and happy sounding. Those same journeys go on in a symphony by Tchaikovsky, where you hear a melody and at first it's foreboding and traumatic and then later it's tender and lyrical and then later it's triumphant and and so if you've kind of gotten used to that idea of hearing how melodies transform that sets you up with listening skills when you go into what you might call more abstract music um there are lots of musical storytelling um journeys out there i think in my blog post i also mentioned a, a really cool saint paul chamber orchestra performance with puppets um, and um, that story, um, although now oh, I'm saying that- I'm, Race for the Reef. Yes, Race right? for the Reef. That's, yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah, and Race for the Reef is on is available for free on video. Um, it's a puppeteer who named Victor Yared, who has worked on all kinds of, he was on like, worked on The Dark Crystal on Netflix and has worked on all kinds of television shows as a puppeteer. But he started out as a classical percussionist who went to conservatory and was trained as a classical musician. And then just, you know, he also was a puppeteer and that's where his career went. So he's cre started creating children's performances for orchestras where he uses like high level uh, Hollywood puppets and, uh, you know, high level Hollywood comedy writers to write a goofy <laughs> story that connects to a classical piece. Um, or that uses a classical piece to underscore it. Um, and Race for the Reef is a, an enjoyable, fun uh, story. But there are there are lots of other examples of this. And if you go to um, family concerts, young people's concerts with the San Antonio mm -hmm. Symphony, um, almost every year there's some kind of a storytelling piece like this. In like general, the they're they're. they're, they're Oh, the composer is dead. Is that one of the right? The composer is dead by Nathaniel Stuke. Yeah, is another figure, story that yeah. <laughs> that has been really popular, and it's funny, and it's and it's clever, and and um, you know, they those concerts are geared a little bit more towards sort of elementary school age children, for sure. Um, and Peter the Wolf is is I think the strike zone for Peter the Wolf I think is more like third grade than preschool. I mean, preschoolers won't hate it, but it's a long enough story. It's almost a half an hour long. So yeah. it's more, it connects better with elementary school age kids. Um, and there's a ton of great versions. There's a Disney version, cartoon version, but it's actually hard to find. It's not on Disney plus. Mm. Um, I'm sure eventually it will be. Um, but my favorite version of Peter and the Wolf is actually narrated by David Bowie. And if you just uh, go out on cool. the internet and just search for David Bowie, Peter and the Wolf, there's a great version that he told, but there's tons of others with, you know, Jonathan Winters and all kinds of other comedians and actors have done this story. Um, and so if you look around on Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube or anywhere that you're gonna find a lot of different versions and then just give it a shot. Um, for older kids, yeah. there's another one that I would mention that I, that I love, um, which is a piece by Stravinsky called The Soldier's Tale. Um, mm. Now this is a more of a high school age or middle school, maybe middle school age experience, um, but it's a kind of a Faust legend, a story about um, a, a somebody selling his soul to the devil to get special powers. And so he sells his soul to get a magic violin and then he's in this battle with the devil. And, and it's, um, 
it's wacky and the music is amazing and it's often done with dancers too and so there's a lot mm. of great versions of that there's also versions where it's just the music the music's cool but you want to look for a version where there's somebody talking and telling the story um and but there's a lot of those and you know uh, the bottom line is um that it's another way to get people connected to narrative i know um you had a chat with nathan Cohn recently and um, films, are, of course, are another great way to get these connections to happen. If your kids love a particular film or a particular film series that has a, a kind of a thrilling orchestral score, um, then just putting that music on in the background is a really fun way to get kids to be more connected to the, the power of that music. For my generation, uh, I was eight years old when the first Star Wars movie came out. And so I grew up listening to those Star Wars scores, to um, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones music. And yeah. you know that stuff was great. I think the Harry Potter scores, of course, a lot mm. of people have fallen in love with that music. Um, yeah. But there are a lot of things like that where the, 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 um, a lot of the Japanese animated films have really remarkable orchestral scores. Um, so if you find your kids responding to some kind of piece of culture in film or even in video games that has orchestral music, just kind of pulling that music up on Spotify or um, just having it be part of your own life can be a way for you to connect with something they already care about. Um, yeah, I my son loves experience. science fiction movies. Yeah, right. My, my son loves science fiction, and he, like he's he's gone around on, uh, like added to his playlist on Amazon Music like different. Um, themes from different film scores and stuff. And then like, we'll go in the car, we'll plug in, be like, okay, it's Nicholas's playlist, put it on shuffle. And then like a film score pops up. But I was really like pleased and surprised that he was adding orchestral music to his playlist. Not not just, um, you know, pop songs or or like video game <laughs> background music. He likes that too. Right. Although we, we, we've come across some video games that had actually re really good jazz music. There's a game called Does Not Commute that has a really nice like modern jazz score. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's a tremendous amount of great music all over the world in all kinds of places. And certainly video game composers have done amazing work. Some of the video games, some of the most intense video games actually have amazing orchestral scores. Um, and you know, some of the classic games of the previous decade like Halo or Skyrim, um, there's a ton of these that have just Final Fantasy have really, like symphonic, like uh, like huge wow. dramatic, um, kind of Carmina Burana kind of scores with right. chorus and orchestra and banging drums and you know it's I mean that one of the things that video games and films teach us is that orchestral music rocks you know like if you want yeah. power if you want something to feel yeah. epic like you, you know you, you don't go usually to a drum machine you don't go usually to a synthesizer like you usually go to big giant chorus and orchestra and and it just it yeah. delivers a kind of impact um it's not the only way to do it of course but it's i think that association is really powerful and i think um for all of us like fostering that love and then going like yeah i love john williams i should also check out Gustav Holst's Planets, or I should also check out Mahler. And, and that's another uh, way to go. Um, one of the things I talked about in my blog post is this great series of videos from the San Francisco Symphony um, that they are sharing for free on YouTube that are documentaries about the historical context of a piece of music. And right. Right. you know that, that takes things to the next level. That's definitely more of like a high school thing. And you have to be careful because it it's definitely can feel like homework if it's not something that we're all entering into with a spirit of discovery and like wanting to be there. Um, but these 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 films are really great to like learn what what was this composer going through when he wrote this piece, but also from that to learn like what was life like in Soviet Russia in the 1940s and what did that mean? What was life like in Central Europe? when Napoleon was coming to power and what did that mean? Um, you know, that those are kinds of things that, again, it's not usually something you're wrestling with in elementary school, but at a certain point, like getting that music and culture are intertwined, music and history are intertwined. If you wanna understand American history and the civil rights movement, 
you know, learn about when Billie Holiday lost her cabaret license in New York and what that meant in terms of white supremacy and the oppression of black musicians and what it led to in her own artistry. And, you know, like there's so many examples of that, um, but because classical music has this several centuries long history, it, it connects with that really powerfully. Right, which is right. It opens doors to so many eras of history. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, and then one of the things, yeah, I mean, this is a very speculative question, but like, you know, um, you know, a lot of musicians are are kind of stuck at home, right? So uh, what do you think that um, may come out of this time period of, of people not being able to perform as much? Hopefully they're still practicing, right? But, um, you know, like what kind of, how do you think the creative juices are flowing? And what do you think um, artists and composers are going to create um, during these, these challenging times? I think it's... Um a complicated mix right now, to be honest with you. I think like everybody in the world, there are among, there, among artists, there is um, a struggle to get through kind of ennui or fear mm -hmm. or anxiety, right? Um, yeah. But at the same time, for most artists I know, there is a, a rejoicing at a different way to structure our daily lives, right? And for me personally, I'm a composer and a conductor, and I've written more, I've spent more time in my life writing music in the last 90 days than I have been able to for 20 years because I am not spending as much time on the podium in front of an orchestra. I'm not spending any time on the podium in front of an orchestra. <laughs> and, just, and I mean, I have yeah. lots of other administrative work to do and I'm teaching online and I'm you know, planning for the future but I've also had more time to write a piece of music. And so I think that it is true that composers are gonna be creating more music. I know for a fact that performers uh, in classical music and jazz have been performing in new ways and, and you know, thinking about how they can create content that connects with people through online media. Um, yeah. And honestly, you know, right now, Inga, we're in this in this week where I think also every artist I know is reflecting more about um, power structures and racial oppression yeah. and the struggles in our country's history and our yeah. struggles in our country's present. And I think that's going to yeah. inform people's work too in really powerful ways. Like there's a lot of people thinking about how can I use my art to make the world a better place and how can I use my art to to foster liberty, to foster freedom, to foster justice. Um, and and uh, so I think that that it's an exciting time. Um, the other flip side, not you know, the flip side is that we don't know what the future holds for orchestras and choirs right now. And just as one example, I'm writing a piece for chorus and orchestra for the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. I'm really grateful that they invited me to write this piece. And taking poetry by a Vermont poet who's a, an old dear friend of mine. And then she wrote these beautiful nature poems and I'm setting them to music for chorus and orchestra. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't know when choruses are gonna be able to sing again because all, having a hundred people standing right on top of each other and singing is, is tough air. right now. Yeah, and yeah exactly. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I don't know what the future of the piece will be, but I'm confident mm -hmm. that it, at some point, we're all going to come back together, and this piece is going to come to life with real life humans. And um, so, it's been exciting. It, it will be even more precious when it finally does come to life, right? People will right. be so, have such a deep thirst to right. hear a, a chorus sing again after. And, yeah. and music is a tremendous solace if if yeah. we use it right. And that's one of the things I've been speaking with the Yosa musicians I work with about a lot. And something I've also talked with about with my own kids about is like, you know, I think during the pandemic that all of us have had hard days or hard afternoons or just moments where you're just like, okay, I feel trapped. I feel directionless. I feel lost. Well, for me, the first time I felt that way, I sat down with one of my very favorite pieces of music in the world, the second symphony by Johannes Brahms. And I just sat in a room by myself and listened to this piece. Honestly, I listened to it straight through twice, which it's a piece that lasts like 40 minutes. So yeah. I just listened to it straight through twice. 
And the second time through, actually one of my kids came in um, partway through and sat with me for a while and listened to it and kind yeah. of snuggled up with me. And then, yeah. and then, you know, went back upstairs. And it was just like, it was this really nice little quiet bonding moment, but yeah. music you love can bring you to a place of, of safety and consolation. And we want to give that to our kids, right? We want to yeah. foster a situation where our kids have that music that will, that they can turn to in, in tough yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, because there's amazing stuff out there, and I think I want to encourage. Um, part of the, the purpose is encourage parents to like, you know, find like try the suggestions that you have in your blog post. You know, find uh, we have we have a, a book of like you know 100 greatest recordings, right? It's, you can just sample among those things and and just like bring music into your life because um, you know even though you know we're kind of staying home a lot, um, you know, music brings it brings the outside world and it brings all these all these emotions and all this history. Um, you know, to us. And so then we, we don't feel like we're struggling through this alone. We feel like, you know, we're, we're connected to greater humanity um, through works of creativity. And I hope people still feel like they can uh, create and they can plan for the future and they can have hope. So oh, wait, tell me about when you talk to U.S. musicians, you tell them like, keep practicing, like don't, <laughs> don't well, slack off, right? <laughs> I mean, I think that what I'm trying to send the message is like, basically, you already love music. Music is something that can make you feel better. That doesn't mean that practicing is always fun. So I'm not saying like, feel guilty, work harder. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is <laughs> connect with the ways that music makes you feel better. Um, and so that can be listening to your favorite piece of music that you've ever played, or it can be giving yourself permission to have practice sessions that are just fun. Because practice isn't always fun. A lot of times in practice, you're solving problems. You're trying to fix things. Um, it's like a workout. Um, and yeah. so give yourself permission to just play. To just And actually, that's the important thing with practice all the time. You want you want to always give yourself permission to have parts of your practice that are just fun. They're just you playing something you love. And then other parts of your practice need to be identifying what stinks and making it better. Um, and uh, so right now i think it's important to just to just have times in your day where you go to music and honestly um i think for musicians we talk a lot about how the development of social media has like for everybody in the world you know it's easy to find yourself having stared at your twitter timeline for an hour and a half and you know not feeling like you're in a better place than you were when you started um it still means, I mean, it doesn't mean I'm, I don't connect to things, but I want to remind myself that sometimes instead of doing that or instead of, you know, playing a, a game on my phone or instead of, you know, there that one of the great ways to spend time is with something that provides solace, um, something that makes me feel better. Um, and of course, you can also listen to music while you stare at your Twitter timeline, and that would also be good. But you or know, I don't know. Washing I, feel, dishes. I feel like I'm always washing dishes because we you know, we're, we're not eating out. So right, right. <laughs> so I oh my god, there's so many. Yeah. There's so many more dishes, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, you know, and I, I like, I also have a podcast problem. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I love them, but I've started to remind myself over the last couple of years, actually, like I am going to. I, I have basically Tuesday is a day where I don't listen to podcasts. I only listen to music. And I did that because I was finding I was listening to a lot less music. So I just said, on Tuesday, I don't listen to podcasts. On Tuesday, I'm going to put music on in the car. And it's, I have all kinds of projects with forcing myself to listen to, um, not forcing myself, but reminding myself to listen to new pop music, new rock music. Um, that because you know i'm getting older and i want to make sure that i have <laughs> some connection to what's going on today well, that's um, part of what's cool about yosa is right y'all do concerts um where you you're you're mixing uh right you have like yosa musicians and you bring in like local pop musicians right and there's right there are concerts about selena and prince and right and, absolutely yeah, so, yeah. So keeping it relevant <laughs> yeah well I'm, I'm a it's the same it's my philosophy i laid out earlier today that I don't, I, I think music is music and that doesn't mean, I mean, I think there's good music and there's less good music. And, you know, I, I think, I don't mean it's all equal in quality, but I mean right, that right. it's quality isn't about genre or style. Right. Quality is about artistry of the people involved. And right. so there's right. great hip hop and there's great country music and there's great gamelan and there's great 
Korean folk music. And, you know, the, our job in life is to find this stuff and, and spend time with it. Um, yeah. So at Yosa, one of the things we try to do is, is make sure that we're, I mean, we're an orchestra, don't get me wrong, we're a series of orchestras. Right. And so the right. core of our work is orchestral music. Right. But it's super exciting when, when we take a dozen San Antonio bands and orchestrate the songs to play a complete Prince album or a complete Beatles album or a complete Radiohead album. And you have a mix of different styles of artists playing with the orchestra. And we do this because it's a way to create new work. It's a way to engage with different listeners. It's a way for our young musicians to learn that how to feel rhythm in different ways and how to make music in different ways um, that enrich everything else they do. So, and the concerts were a lot of fun. So yeah, in March we did, actually the last time I was on stage was a Viva Selena, a tribute to Selena with Yosa and um, complete evening of songs by Selena. Um, and we hope that by next spring we'll be presenting another one. I hope so. I hope, one thing I want to be sure to ask listeners is to please support Yosa. And here's the link to the website, yosa.org. And um, you know, I think every every nonprofit is struggling right now because you can't um, can't sell tickets, right? And you can't you can't do the activities that you normally do. But we all want um, arts organizations like Yosa to survive this situation. And um, I think you've just made a really strong case for you know the value that classical music and orchestras provide to to children and families and um, you know why Yosa needs to needs to continue. So please uh, please uh, readers listeners please support Yosa. Go to yesa.org and donate. Okay. Thanks so much, Inga. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, do you have any kind of closing thoughts? Um, anything? You, I, I mean, I, I think the blog post is fantastic. I, it'll be up on the site soon. I'll, I'll update the description of the video so readers can um, click through and and find these great suggestions for these like I think like puppet shows and you know uh, exploring the historical context of classical music pieces and uh, you know just getting on the floor with your kids and put on the classical music and let everyone dance. <laughs> it sounds like a great way to spend time. Yeah, I mean, the only th other thing I'd say is that people always ask me, how do you get your kids started playing music? And the thing I'd say is foster a love of music and then don't force it too early unless it's something that a kid seeks out. One of the main reasons that there are kids who had to start in instruments and quit is that often their parents started them earlier than the kids wanted to. Some kids want to start piano or violin at five or six, but most kids don't. And so for most kids, the it's more like 10 to 12 when they're really receptive to diving into an instrument because it takes a higher level of, of cognitive endurance to get through the challenges yeah. of that. And, um, and then, you know, support it. And uh, there's a lot of different ways to handle things, but I would just say like, um, you know, if you need support on resources for starting kids on instruments um, there, you can certainly reach out to me. My email is easy to find uh, through the Yosa website. And if you ever want advice or guidance on how to help a kid become a performer and learn more about, in, about playing an instrument, feel free to reach out. Oh, that's a great offer. I really appreciate that. I think I'm sure there are members of the Charter Moms community, moms and dads who, um, you know, are, are wondering about that for their kids. And um, yeah, that's a, I think, I think hoping, planning for a bright future is a good way to uh, cope with these circumstances, you know, so like picture, picture yourself in, you know, at a podium conducting an orchestra again, you know, students so can picture themselves, you know, on stage playing with the orchestra again, that uh, these times, these times, we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're going to close off this video and uh, I look forward to sharing it with, with readers and we'll see um, how people comment and how people respond. So thanks so thank much. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye.